Good morning. Friends, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was and is and is yet to come. We're delighted that you've joined us on this Palm Sunday, whether you're joining us in person or online, as we begin the journey in Jesus' last week and as we enter into Holy Week. I want to remind you that as we worship together in the back of your pews, you will see a yellow prayer card. If you have a prayer concern or a joy that you wish to lift up among the community, I just invite you to fill that out. And one of the ushers will get that for you from you during our time of prayer. Additionally, any time throughout the worship service, if you wish to light a candle in honor or memory of someone or representing a prayer that you have, you're invited to do that during our songs of praise. Friends, I want to invite us into a time of stillness and reflection as we prepare to enter into Holy Week. <laughs>
as you are able for the call to worship. Come from the city streets. Come from your busy homes and places of business. Come, lay down your sorrow and worries. Let all join in the joyful song.
join me in our unison prayer. God of joy and arrival, enter our lives as Christ entered Jerusalem. May we celebrate your coming. May we cry out with the stones so the world might hear your glad arrival. Yet do not leave us in the events to come. From a crowd of hosannas, we turn into a silent, denying crowd at the cross. Do not leave us in the events to come. Even though we may leave you, do not leave us, O Christ. Then forgive us, so we can return to you changed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take this opportunity to share the love and peace of Christ with one another. words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40, from the New Revised Standard Version. After he had said this, he went ahead, going up to Jerusalem. 
when he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had, been, had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my lips be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here at the church, we've been looking to hire a full-time director of youth, as well as someone to lead our modern worship service. And um, thankfully, as I've been a pastor here, I haven't had to do a lot of hiring. So recently, I started to make a list of interview questions to help prepare our staff parish committee for a recent interview. And I just felt like I was getting nowhere. Somewhere after I wrote, if you could be an animal, what kind of animal would you be? <laughs> I realized I might need some help. Um, and so thankfully, my husband is a corporate recruiter and he interviews um, on a daily basis. And so we began to talk a little bit about behavioral interviewing, which I'm sure many of us have experienced. And it's basically when an interviewer will ask you how you've dealt with a situation in the past as opposed to how you might handle one. So instead of saying, tell me how you handle conflict, They'll ask, tell us about a time that you had a disagreement with another staff member. Um, and, and the idea is you don't want to learn what the candidate thinks they're going to do, but you want to know how they've responded in the past. And the interesting thing to me with the style of interviewing is that sometimes the best answers to these questions are when times when people have completely failed, when they've made a mistake that they had to fix or learn from, or ask for help, or even admit their wrongdoing. Because I think as humans, we want to present ourselves as capable and intelligent people. And that's especially true when you're in a job interview. But any of us who want to succeed in life, we know that we first have to learn how to fail well. And I think Jesus' disciples in particular felt this truth. As the disciples were interviewing for a job, it seems like for them, it's mostly been failure after failure. There was a time in the Gospels when they argued about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There was a time when they were on a boat and a storm rolled in, and they began to panic because Jesus was asleep. There was this other time that there was a village that didn't receive Jesus, and so the disciples asked if they should call down fire from heaven. Plenty of stuff for a job interview. But I think for them, it seems like this is the week it's started to come together for them on Palm Sunday. The disciples are like those guys who bought Bitcoin when it was a dollar, and now it's worth like 50000 They got in early on this Jesus thing, and it's about to pay off. On Palm Sunday, they know that he's going to be welcomed into Jerusalem like a conquering war hero. The crowd is going to come and shout, Hosanna, God save us, and the disciples are going to be right behind him parading in. But unfortunately, what they don't realize is that this isn't the beginning of something big, but it's the end of something big. That they're about to experience the greatest heartbreak, the greatest disappointment, and fear and failure that they'd ever known. We talked a lot about reckless love over this season of Lent, and I think the disciples are about to learn that sometimes great love involves great pain. 
Sometimes it takes failure on our part to take us to the place where we're able to accept God's reckless love for ourselves. We discover that our daughter Eliza, who's sick, she, she leans a little bit towards a perfectionist. You know, some things come really easy for her, so when things don't come easy for her, she gets impatient really quickly, just like this other parent who lives in our home. <laughs> and so a few weeks ago, my husband Dan was trying to teach her how to tie her shoes, and so we prepped her for this by saying, you know, some things in life come easy to you, and other things you really have to work for. So we're going to have to try a few times, and you're probably going to get frustrated, and we're probably going to have to take a break. Um, and so Stan started teaching her, and about the third time, she threw her shoes on the ground and said, I'll never be able to tie my shoes. And I think one of the things that, that we want to do if we're parents, or aunts or uncles, or, or we mentor younger children, is we want to teach kids how to be able to fail well, and how to not be afraid to failure and how to learn humility when we make mistakes. Because that's just part of life. And, and I think for us, if our hearts are open to it, it's in our failures that we experience the depth of God's grace. Often it's when we come face to face with our mistakes, and even our sin, that allows us to see our need for grace. I think about Palm Sunday and Holy Week, and in particular, this was the last week of Jesus' life on earth. And how many of the disciples, even leading up to Good Friday, failed to see God's purpose. They've seen Jesus' reckless love for everyone around them, but they still didn't realize where it was leading them. You know, just before this triumphal entry in Mark's gospel, there's a story about two disciples, James and John. And they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we want you to do something for us. When you're in heaven and all your glory is seen in your throne, we want to sit at your right hand and your left. We want that privilege, that prestige, and that power. And after three years, they still didn't get it, that Jesus didn't come for prestige and power, but he left his privilege to serve the least of these. And it's interesting because in this story, when the other disciples heard about this conversation, they were angry. But I don't think they were angry because they were like, come on, guys, haven't you realized... Jesus doesn't care about those things. I think they were angry because they didn't think to ask the question first. And so the weeks of Holy Week begin to unfold, and we know that the city of Jerusalem is really amped up. Everyone's in town for the Passover celebration. Rome is starting to get nervous because there's a lot of tension around this Jesus guy. And the final events of Jesus' life begin to unfold. You get to Thursday of that week, and the disciples have a meal. And Jesus tells one of his closest friends that one of them is about to betray him. A little while later, as they're leaving this meal, Jesus predicts another disciple, Peter, will deny that he's even known him. And so they go out into this garden to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus asks his disciples to pray with him. And the Gospels tell us that he prayed so intensely that his sweat were like drops of blood. Jesus gets done praying and he goes back. And he finds the disciples, and they were asleep. On this night of all nights, they're found sleeping. Then the Roman soldiers, they come to arrest Jesus. Peter grabs a sword, he cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers. And so if we pause this story for just a moment, we step back and we review how the disciples did on their final exam during the last week of Jesus' life. We see betrayal, carelessness, selfishness, negligence, violence. And I just wonder, what have these guys been doing for three years? If we had high hopes of anyone acing the Christian life, it was these guys. They were the ones who got to live with Jesus, to touch him, to live side by side, day in and day out. They should have gotten it. And this sounds a lot like failure. They spend three years of their life with him, and during this final week, they bombed the final exam. And what was the point of Jesus' life if even his disciples didn't get it? And perhaps that leads us to this truth that even in our greatest failure, we find God's reckless love. I mean, after all, there's a cross because we fail to love God and our neighbors as we should. There's a cross because we can't beat our addictions on our own. There's a cross because greedy dictators invade the lands of other people and cause great harm and destruction. 
There's a cross because even though there's enough to go around in our world, people are still without clothing and food and shelter. There's a cross because racial inequality exists. There's a cross because even on your best days, you need God. And I think there's a cross because anything short of reckless love wouldn't have gotten our attention. You know, Holy Week, more than any other week in the Christian calendar, reminds us of our need for grace. And often it's in our mistakes and our failure and our sins that we experience that cross of grace. I'm reminded that this season for us begins with Ash Wednesday, a service that's often reflective and somber, with a focus on our sin and our mortality. And I'm reminded that throughout Lent, we have to have an accurate view of our sin to more clearly see our need for grace. And though the disciples, the religious leaders, the Romans, the Jewish people, though they often missed it, As they looked ahead to the end of that week in their failure, they realized what reckless love is all about. Holy Week reminds us of what it costs God to give that love to us. And as I think about failure in the disciples, one of the things that that I admire about one of the disciples, Peter in particular, is how failure didn't stop him from taking risks. In other places in the Gospels, he began to walk on water. And then he started to sink. Jesus told Peter that he was the rock on which he would build the church. In the same chapter, Jesus referred to him as Satan. He told Jesus that he would never leave him. And then hours later denied ever knowing him. You know, failure is part of the human experience. But how we respond to that failure determines the type of lives that we will lead. And I think we've all been the disciples in this last week in Jesus' life, we've all been Peter. When we've heard that rooster crow and we realize the weight of our actions, we've all done things that we wish we could take back or that we regret. We've had those cut-to-the-heart moments. I reminded of a book that came out in the early 90s by Stephen R. Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he tells a story about being on the subway and a man and his young children entered in And he said the kids were yelling back and forth, they were throwing things, they were grabbing people's newspapers, and it was really disturbing. And yet this father sitting next to me did nothing. He said it was difficult for me to not feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive to let his children run wild and do nothing about it. It was easy to see that everyone else in the subway felt irritated too. So finally, with what I felt like was unusual patience and restraint, I said, sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you could control them a little bit more. The father lifted his gaze as if coming to consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh yeah, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago, and I don't know what to think, and I guess my kids don't know how to handle it either. And he went on to say, can you imagine what I felt in that moment? Suddenly, I began to see things differently. I felt cut to the heart by my words. I think we've all felt that, that cut to the heart moment, when we've done something that we wish we could have taken back. It's how Peter felt when he heard the rooster crow three times. It's how Judas felt when he kissed Jesus and then betrayed him. It's how the disciples felt when they were nowhere to be found during Jesus' trial. It's how we feel when we realize we would have been right there in the crowd along with them yelling, crucify him. And I think in many ways we do anything to not feel that way, to not feel the burden of the weight that that our actions have caused harm to others, to not look back at situations and say, if I'd just done something differently, if I would have just responded differently, I could have changed the entire outcome of that situation. You know, failure will always be a part of our lives. But in Holy Week, Jesus comes along to remind us that there's forgiveness. And that he offers to set us free from our shame and our guilt and our sin. But first, we have to face our failures. And it hurts. And it's uncomfortable. But we don't get to the cross without failure. And that's what Holy Week offers us the opportunity to do. Would you pray with me? 
Oh God, we confess that we are far from perfect. And that more times than not, we get it wrong than we get it right. But God, as we step into this week and we remember the crowd that welcomed you, that cried, Hosanna, save us, and then so quickly turned to a crowd that yelled, crucify him. God, as we step into this week, maybe you give us the courage that we need to reflect. To reflect each day on your goodness and your love. That in doing so, we may reflect the mortality of our lives. But that your love is still deeper. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Worship as a church is by joining together in communal prayer. Today we will be using the Prayers of the People format, which is marked by moments of silence interspersed throughout the prayer. In each of the silences, you are encouraged to lift your own silent prayers. Um, I do ask you to note that we are doing a different response this morning. And so, Hosanna, God save us. And after the moment of silence, I'll start that, but I expect you to join me. <laughs> At this
this time, I would invite you to join me by preparing yourselves as we approach God in prayer. We pray to you, good and gracious God, by lifting up to you our heartfelt prayers. Throughout time and trial, you have led us through the wilderness on paths long and toilsome. Together, we follow you to the dark hour when you will be betrayed and broken. As our faces are turned to the cross, strengthen our wearied souls that we might continue with faithful footsteps and follow the course that you have set. <laughs> Hosanna, God save us. We gather to begin Holy Week, a week though dark and dismal that is nevertheless a preparation for resurrection, a resurrection in which we have been sealed in our baptisms. Together we are preparing to be renewed by the light of the empty tomb. What will we find there? What truths will be discovered in the light of Easter morning? Hosanna, God save us. As we march together to Jerusalem through Gethsemane and to the hill of the cross, we pray for our community of Bowling Green. We pray that all in our community would know that they are deeply loved by you. Remind us that you ask us to be the harbingers of this message. Specifically, we pray for our neighbors. We pray for neighbors who participate in our food pantry ministry, the families and staff at Crim Elementary, the Cocoon, BGSU, and our FUM Learning Center. Lord, help us to be better partners to all those serving your world. Hosanna. God, save us. Lord God, in this time of impending conflict between nations, this time when we are being tested to see if we will do justice as well as love mercy, we pray for guidance and for your light to lead the way of the rulers of our nation and the nations about us. Hosanna, God save us. We pause to offer our silent concerns before you now. Where harm has left deep scars, bring healing. Where there is darkness, bring light. Where there is confusion, bring clarity. Where our inner struggles threaten to overtake us, give us strength. May our souls always find rest in you. Be with every one of us as we seek to prepare for your resurrection by following you to your death. Hosanna, God save us. Help us to rest in the comforting truth that in life and in death we belong to you. Give us strength. Give us courage. And now, with all the powers of creation, with gladness and nourishment that sustains us each day, we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
ways that we respond and worship is through the offering of our gifts. And I am um, grateful for our choir, in particular our choral scholars who offer and share their gifts with us each week. And um, our choir isn't going to be with us much longer this season. April 24th will be their last Sunday. And so following that service um, also happens to be our celebration Sunday for removing the stone. So we will be having a small cake reception um, in honor of the choir as well as removing the stone. So we encourage you, if you're here on that Sunday, um, to stick around. I also want to remind you one way that you can offer yourself. Um, we are revisioning Martha's Kitchen, which before COVID used to be our weekly meal. And so on May 7th, we will have our first monthly Love BG neighborhood lunch. We'll be inviting all those in our neighborhood as well as our community partners. Um, and we'd also like to invite you. So we encourage you, if you're in town, to come out, um, fellowship with those in the congregation, but in particular, those within our community. As the ushers prepare to come, let us prepare to worship through the sharing of our gifts.
loving and generous God, we give you great thanks for all the ways that you've extended your love and compassion to us. So on this day, we offer back to you a portion of what you've so generously given to us. May you use it to increase our influence and our mission in this community so others might know your light and your love. In the name of Christ, we give thanks. Amen. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. He, he brought a dead man back to life? You saw this yourself? I did. He had been dead for three days, three whole days in the tomb. Shut up. Then this Jesus comes. He was friends with the man's sisters, too. He comes and he tells them to open the tomb. They looked at him like he was crazy. We all did. But they opened the tomb and he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. He walked out of the tomb, alive as you or me. It seems not even the grave could contain the power that this Jesus brought with him. The crowd was abuzz with stories about this man who they heard was coming to Jerusalem that day. Those who had seen him before and many of those who had witnessed the miracles that happened at his hands were drawn out into the streets to welcome him. And they told their neighbors, their friends, their family. The streets were lined by swells of souls who wanted to catch a glimpse of this Jesus, this king. I heard he was destined to become our king. Surely he will ride in on a magnificent steed, sword by his side, an army behind him. 
He will save us from the oppressing hand of Rome that is crushing us. He will be our prophet. He's a prophet like Elijah and Daniel or one of the others. He's here to bring us some divine news. He's here to bring us a message from God. He is a man, just a man, flesh and bone and a whole lot of fanfare over nothing. In fact, I heard he's a Nazarene. Ha! Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But I know to the religious leaders, he's a... A threat. A very real and dangerous threat. A threat that must finally be answered, and soon. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem continued to sweep through the city, and the large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him, and they cheered him, saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Most of the crowd spread their branches and garments on the road ahead of him. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Hail to the King of Israel! Praise God for the Son of David! And Jesus didn't come on horseback like a conquering king. He rode humbly on the back of a donkey's colt. And he didn't come in an opulent chariot brandishing a gilded sword. He came with the clothes on his back and dust on his feet. And behind him, not an army, marching in rows by the thousands. He was trailed by a ragamuffin group of fishermen, and the poor, the outcasts, the nobodies. Some laid down their palms to praise their king. Some laid down their palms to praise their lord. Soon he would lay down his life for them all. Because among the crowd stirred a poison among the people. The religious leaders of the day, in their corrupt hearts, a wicked plot was thickening and hardening like stone, like the whitewashed tombs they were. They would dethrone this king of the Jews, whatever vicious route that must take. Their blood boiled over his constant rebuffing of their evil advances against him. He simply would not go away, and he would not fall into any of their traps. So since he wouldn't fall... They would have to push him. Since he would not be trapped, they would have to catch him. And bind him. And frame him. And blame him. And falsely accuse him. Falsely convict him. Falsely understand him. And the crowd that shouts, Hosanna, today, spreading the cloaks off their backs to honor him, breaking palms off of trees and prostrating them at his holy feet. Crucify him! Will demand the breaking of his body tomorrow. See, this gets us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They will resolutely require the laying down of the law upon his innocent head. He threatens our way of life, our position, our pride. The little baby has left the manger to live a life like the life he gave us and restore the life that we left in Eden. Our God incarnate, king of creation, proven power over death. Power over death? They say he raised a man from the dead? They say he walked right out of the tomb. Well, let's see how he fares when it's his body in the grave, his body in the tomb. Hosanna! Crucify Hosanna! him! Hosanna! Crucify Hosanna! him! Hosanna! Crucify Hosanna! him! Hosanna! Crucify him! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
Friends, the week before us, hold both life and death. May you choose to walk this path with our crucified Lord. Go in peace.